Hello and welcome to this Bioprocess International Ask the Expert webcast. I'm your host, Leah Rosen, the online editor for Bioprocess International. Before we get started, just a couple of notes. This webcast is being recorded and will be made available for replay in the multimedia section of our website. We've muted your audio lines, but we welcome you to type in your questions for our speaker in the chat window on your screen. After the presentation, we will begin the question and answer portion, and I will ask our speaker your questions from the chat window. Your questions in the chat window will only be visible to myself and our speaker. So with that, I'd like to thank you for joining us today, and it's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Kevin O'Donnell from TOSO Bioscience. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for attending. Um, what I've been asked to do is to essentially boil down 20 years' worth of column packing experience into a 15-minute presentation. So there is a, a lot of information uh, that I'm not going to be able to cover in such a short period of time. So if you do have questions specific to what I'm talking about, please uh, either ask them or uh, later on you'll uh, be able to uh, access uh, the presentation and uh, in that we'll have my uh, email address so you can ask me that as well. What I'd like to do first is to just jump right into the presentation and go through several different uh, definitions. Uh, the first of those is a fixed axial compression column. Uh, this is one of the columns that has been around for many, many years. It's essentially the first type of column that was ever designed. Uh, the resin that you're packing into the column is transferred into the column and then allowed to settle over time or you can start flow immediately uh, at either a variable flow rate or at a constant pressure. Uh, unfortunately, with this type of column, once you consolidate the bed, you have to release the pressure uh, and lower the adapter onto the settled bed. This type of column packing works quite well, uh, but can be time consuming. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, due to the requirement that you have to have multiple column uh, adjuster ad, uh, adapters, uh, column adjustments. The next type of column, which was designed uh, primarily for the types of resins that shrink and swell quite readily uh, in reverse phase chromatography, is called a dynamic axial compression column. And in this case, what happens is that the slurry is poured into the column and then the piston is engaged using a hydraulic fluid uh, to consolidate the bed. Uh, the hydraulic fluid can be things such as air, buffer, uh, even uh, standard hydraulic fluid oil-based. However, uh, most of the time it is typically just a buffer or a air. The pressure is actively or dynamically maintained on the column during operation cleaning and storage. And as I mentioned, this was originally designed for reverse phase applications where the resin would shrink and swell in the presence of organic solvents. So if your bed were to expand or contract by 10, 15, or even 20 percent, the adapter would move in response to that change in bed height. And so uh, it's a very, very elegant design, uh, works quite well, and uh, is, is very useful. The next iteration or next uh, uh, point in the evolution of column is the self-pack columns or the flow-pack columns. I sometimes use those terms interchangeably. And in this case, the columns have special valves which are designed to allow the resin slurry to be bump pumped into an empty column. Uh, you can do this from the top to the bottom or the bottom to the top. And the packing is typically completed when the designated pressure limitation is reached on your pump. Uh, after the bed is consolidated and formed in the column, the slurry valve is either retracted or closed, and the column is essentially ready to use. This type of column is very easy to pack, uh, and you can get very precise column bed heights by placing the adapters in the uh, appropriate positions. Usually, uh, the flow direction is in the opposite direction of the packing direction. However, that's not an absolute requirement, and there are a lot of people that work in both uh, directions. Um, when flowing the column. 
There is one caveat, though, and that is that voids can easily form if the operating pressures exceed the packing pressure. And you can easily do that when you have, say, a packing uh, buffer which is not very viscous or not very high in conductivity, and then when you hit it with a feedstock which may be viscous or very high in conductivity, the bed may uh, begin to shrink a little bit. And when that happens, you get the void that, that, that is formed. This is typically uh, catastrophic in most cases for a well-run column. So given those three different types of columns, some of the things you want to know when you go ahead and start packing these columns is that you would like to know what your maximum operating flow rate is, your maximum operating pressure. Most systems are uh, designed to withstand up to three bar pressure. Uh, are there any hardware limitations? What is the optimal packing buffer? In that case, that would be something that would account for those changes in vis viscosity and or conductivity extremes. You also want to look at the resin slurry concentration, the compression factor of the resin. What is the maximum resin flow rate? Does the resin itself have a limitation as to what the maximum flow rate it is? And then always you like to ask the question, what else do I need to know? What can go wrong? What will go wrong, uh, because invariably something will not go according to plan. Now in packing the column, once the column is packed, what we like to do is do a column efficiency. And in that case, what we typically use is the equations which are shown on this particular slide here, where we look at the plate count using the mid or half height method, which is the width of the peak at half height. Now when you look at the uh, USP, it gives you the formula at the baseline. But most people now, for the sake of uh, uh, simplicity and ease, use the half height method, which is, is shown in this particular slide here. The symmetry is calculated typically at 10% bed height. Some people like to go at lower. Uh, uh, bed height, and some people have occasionally gone to higher uh, uh, peak height when they calculate the symmetry. Now in doing this, uh, one of the things you want to do is calculate what is called the HETP, or the height equivalent to the theoretical plate. And this is just the number of plates divided by the length of the column, or the length of, I'm sorry, the length of the column divided by the number of plates. So it's plates the inverse of plates per meter is now uh, meter per plates, and that is usually converted to centimeters. That's a very good number if you're calculating uh, resins from a variety of different uh, uh, manufacturers. But one thing we like to do is look at the reduced plate height, which is taking the HETP and dividing that by the nominal particle size. And this gives you uh, the the value called H, which is once again the reduced HETP. What this does is this allows you to compare column packing from a variety of different resins of different particle sizes. Typically what we like to see is a reduced plate height somewhere between 5 and 10, and we call that bead width. Occasionally you will see numbers less than 5, but the theoretical minimum is somewhere in the 2 to 3 bead width range. If you get that, you know you have a very, very well-packed column. If you were to get numbers which are less than 2, uh, usually that indicates that you have some sort of interaction with the probe molecule that you're using. If you get numbers above 10, you may want to consider repacking the column. Compression is another factor. Most people now uh, use a very uh, abbreviated method where they take and put a sample of slurry into a conical centrifuge tube and then centrifuge it for uh, just a few minutes and they can get the slurry concentration that way. Uh, alternatively and probably more accurately is if you pour the slurry into a graduated cylinder and let it uh, run uh, or let it settle overnight. Another question we get is how much sample to load. Typically, I like to use 1% of the column volume. Uh, that is particularly important when you get to smaller and smaller particle sizes. It's less important when you have larger particle sizes, as shown in this particular graph here. 
when looking at troubleshooting a poorly packed column, one of the things you have to be aware of is sometimes you will see what is called ion exclusion. And I added this just to show you that if you see something very peculiar with fronting, you may want to add salt to your um, you may want to uh, add salt to your running buffer so that uh, it, it, it accounts for that um, uh, fronting. And you can see that very clearly on this, which is the Toya Pearl GigaCap S650M resin. This is uh, uh, not present in every particular ion exchange resin, but it's just one of those things that you want to be aware of as you go through. As far as troubleshooting, uh, typically you want to see a symmetric peak, but occasionally you'll see fronting or tailing uh, as far as uh, column failure. Cures for peak leading or fronting are to increase the slurry concentration or lower, lowering the pressure that you're packing the column. Peak tailing is a little bit more difficult to uh, diagnose uh, what the root cause is because there are a lot more reasons for peak tailing. If you have low column efficiency, uh, one of the things you can do is remove fines, re-equilibrate, uh, change sample, uh, sample buffer, like I mentioned uh, before with uh, adding salt to the running buffer, and obviously to make sure that you check the detector and pump. You want to minimize the length of the run from the bottom of the column to the detector as much as possible so that uh, you account for any low efficiency. So to kind of conclude my very, very brief presentation here, uh, the self-pack and dynamic axial compression columns uh, sometimes require special packing skitter protocols. So if you um, are going to be packing a lot of columns over a long extended period of time, it is worth that investment to do that because it does pack much quicker uh, and you can pack columns in minutes rather than, an hour, than in hours. Uh, if you do use the dynamic axial compression component, uh, you can over compress the resin, in which case you start to see fronting. And what we also recommend is to pack in water, uh, not to pack in water, uh, because that can lead to increased tailing and less bed stability. What I like to say is you're going to pack the column in the most extreme conditions that the resin will see throughout its lifetime. And one last thing here is a word about frontal analysis. Uh, without going into a lot of description of what frontal analysis is, that is sometimes called transition analysis. And that can be a very valuable tool in monitoring the stability of the bed throughout the resin lifetime. I don't recommend using transition or frontal analysis at the very beginning to determine whether you have a well-packed column or not. I like to use the, uh, the standard uh, uh, column efficiency with HETP and asymmetry. But in conjunction with that, use a frontal analysis uh, and monitor that as you go through the lifetime. And when you start to see uh, deterioration of the frontal analysis, then you know that you are starting to see deterioration of the column packing. So um, uh, with that, I will turn it back and uh, be glad to hopefully uh, uh, answer a couple of your questions in the short period of time we have left. Thank you, Kevin. So we do, we have a question, which is the preferable method for column packing at high scale columns? I, I'm, I'm sorry, would you repeat that, at high scale columns? Yes. Okay. I'm thinking large scale. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's what I was thinking too, is, is just to make sure that that would be large scale columns. Um, the, the packing method there, uh, you can use any method. You can get well-packed columns. Uh, but for the sake of buffer consumption and particularly time, usually the self-packed columns are the standard which are used in the industry now. You do not have to use those. Uh, I have packed very large columns with uh, standard axial compression uh, methods, and they work very, very well. But the standard now is to use the self-pack columns uh, that are available. Most of the self-pack columns, if you buy them new as well, have a hydraulic system for the adapter. So you can do a combined self-pack with just a hint of axial compression associated with it. And sometimes that works quite well too. 
But like I said, the standard now is self-pack technology. Okay, great. So we have another question. Um, some vendors show the criteria of H as less than 5, while you mentioned it as less than 10 is still acceptable. And he would like to know what's the factor most affecting this variation. Well, the big thing there is what, what your chromatography requires you to be able to do. Uh, if you have two very well-resolved peaks, uh, you can get away with, if you want to call it that, a column which is, say, has a reduced plate height between 5 and 10. If you're doing an extremely difficult separation, you may need to have a, a reduced plate height less than 5 to be able to obtain that. The key here is that if you know what your process development people are doing and what type of reduced plate height they get in process development, as you scale up, you want to try to maintain that same uh, reduced plate height as best as you possibly can. Sometimes that's very easy to do, and depending upon some resins, that might not be uh, as easy to do. For example, and I, and I go back to the, the, the previous question with the large scale columns, the self pack technology works really, really well until you start to get the very, very small particles. And sometimes the self pack technology does not uh, accommodate or pack uh, small particle size resins. For example, uh, when we are packing our standard Toya Pearl resins, we get uh, uh, very good packing in the self pack technology. But when you go to our smaller particle, our uh, 20 and 30 micron TSK gel type resins, the self pack technology is a little bit more difficult to pack, and you have to take into account a couple of extra factors along with that. Okay, very good. And is there one column packing technique that, that can universally pack resins from all resin makers? I would like to give you the answer yes, but in fact, no. Uh, there is no one set method. Um, every resin is going to have its own uh, minor intricacies, and that includes uh, comparing resins from different vendors. For example, what you use to pack Toya Pearl resins may not be the same as what you would use uh, to pack other types of resins. Um, and even within our Toya Pearl line, we see some very minor and very subtle differences in the way to pack the resin. Uh, in most cases, you can uh, design a method and you, and you get a feel for some resins versus other resins. For example, some resins are more compressible than other resins, uh, and that's particularly true when you look at resins from different uh, vendors. So therefore, uh, the packing technique that you use might be a little bit different for one resin versus another resin. Okay, great. So this will be our last question. Um, if it's a less than 30 micron resin, what additional precautions need to be taken? Um, asymmetry is going till 1.8. Is this still acceptable? Well, once again, a lot depends on your particular uh, chromatography application. Uh, typically, uh, when you have asymmetries that, that get up to 1.8 and greater, uh, the, the concern that I have is when you go to elute your product, the tailing will increase the fraction of uh, the volume of the fraction that you're going to elute off the column. So therefore, you end up diluting your sample a little bit. Now, that may or may not be an issue. But where it really becomes important is if you're collecting a fraction, let's say of 100 liters off a very large column, and you have a carboy or tank that is uh, designed to collect 100 liters, and then all of a sudden you start to see more and more peak tailing, that fraction is now going to be greater than 100 liters. And how are you going to uh, scramble to collect that extra 5, 10, or even 20 liters of resin? With smaller particle sizes, uh, you can pack uh, with the TSK gel resins, you can pack those to the larger scale. We have done that. And what we find is that the TSK gel do like to be packed a little bit higher in pressure compared to the Toya Pearl resins. And in doing that, what you do then is you either 
if you're using the axial compression, you flow it a little bit faster to get the higher pressure, uh, or you compress it with the, with the hydraulics a little bit more uh, to get a little bit higher pressure. So there are ways to uh, pack these smaller particles uh, very efficiently and very effectively to give you very long column lifetimes. Okay, thanks Kevin. And thank you for joining us and for your questions. The recorded version, again, of this webcast will be available for on-demand viewing on our website. And as a registered attendee, you'll receive a follow-up email providing you with a direct link and contact information for following up directly with Kevin about any questions we didn't get to. We look forward to having you join us at our future Bioprocess International Ask the Expert webcast. We have a full lineup covering many aspects of bioprocessing lined up for the duration of the year. Look for those announcements in your inbox. Thanks again.